morning. I think we are ready to start our conference. Uh, I would like to welcome you very warmly at this conference on behalf of Institute of Public Affairs. Uh, the conference which is devoted to women in politics, a joint strategy for East Central Europe, is organized jointly by the Institute and Friedrich Ebert Stiftung uh, and gathers participants not only from Poland but from other uh, Central European countries and I would like to welcome particularly warmly Professor Hertha dobler gmelin a uh, former German Minister of Justice, uh, as well as all the participants from Czech Republic, Hungary and Slovakia who have made their way to Warsaw to talk with us about possible Central European strategies to increase the presence of women in politics. Next year we will be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the transition in Central Europe as well as the 10th anniversary of the enlargement of European Union to include Central European countries. Uh, it's obvious that there will be a lot of discussions trying to sum up this last quarter of century also from the point of view of democracy building and on many levels we will be talking about the successes of our countries in creating stable democracies, in developing our uh, economies. Uh, and uh, even today, uh, Central Europe is often uh, mentioned as a success story in, in terms of democratic transition. However, if you look at, at the history of the last uh, almost 25 years uh, in this part of the world from a gender perspective, you will see that this success story uh, is only half true. And one of the most uh, glaring absences from this narrative of success is the story of women's exclusion, de facto exclusion from the public sphere, the political sphere, and the consequences of this exclusion, such as the specific policies in terms of family policy, social policy, uh, reproductive rights. We cannot forget that one of the funding acts of the Third Republic in Poland was the ban of abortion, the restriction, uh, introduction of a very restrictive law on abortion, which as we speak today, the Polish parliament is trying to make even more restrictive. So we can see how, how sort of one-sided is this story of, of building and creating successful democracy. Uh, when the question of the presence of women or absence of women and the consequences of this absence uh, is not discussed. Uh, one thing that has changed in uh, the discussion uh, of the uh, presence or absence of women in politics is that in recent years, in my view, the, the, the whole topic at least become part of the mainstream political debate. Uh, I think that this is, this is a success of a long work of many uh, organizations and many female, uh, women activists in Poland. Uh, in particular, I would like to mention the activities of Women's Congress because I think uh, their proposal to introduce parities of electoral lists really changed the, the whole terms of, of debate in this country about women's political participation. And even though uh, politically in terms of actual presence of women in the parliament it was only a partial success, we can still say that we are now talking from a different position. The, the question of women's presence in politics, in public life, uh, is, is no longer a marginal issue, it's now a, a central issue of Polish and uh, uh, hopefully other Central European countries, uh, politics. And uh, in Poland I would even say it has already started a kind of backlash against, uh, against this fact uh, that even though the actual gains are not so much visible, the whole topic is, is the center of, of public debate. 
Uh, today we will be discussing about the ways to increase uh, women's participation, not only in terms of sol solutions in electoral law, but all the underlying conditions that will make uh, real progress uh, e in this field uh, possible, uh, underlying conditions in terms of how politics is done in our countries, what are the conditions that for women to compete with men in the political arena. Uh, I hope that, that by, by next year, by uh, when we will be celebrating those anniversaries that I will uh, mention, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we will be already able to see another big step in terms not only of debate, but possibly also some uh, legal solutions, some policy solutions, advancing, uh, advancing the issue of equal participation of women and men uh, in politics. Uh, ending this brief introduction, I would like to thank Friedrich Herbert Stiftung and Knut Detlefsen for uh, excellent cooperation in uh, uh, organizing this debate. Uh, and we'll hand over to Knut to make his introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Jacek. Dzień dobry państwu, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I'm very happy that we meet here today, and uh, let me warmly welcome you on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, to our conference Women in Politics, or let me also cite the Polish title, Nie obecność kobiet w polityce. I'm citing the Polish title because it in a way describes probably better what we talk about, or the, the, the problem or challenge uh, that we talk about, namely the fact that women are still underrepresented in politics and are also underrepresented in particular when it comes to political leadership. And obviously the goal of this conference, which is part of a bigger project, is to find ways and develop strategies how to strengthen women's involvement, but also women's visibility in politics, but also to find ways how women can have a more, much more meaningful and lasting impact and influence on politics. Um, this, is, this conference is part of a bigger project we are trying to do together with the Institut Sprav Publicne to, I would say, to change a little, to change in some ways uh, not only the political scene, but also the way politics is done, meaning more inclusive, more transparent, and also tackling different issues. And I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, to be very clear, to be progressive and, and to, to develop a progressive agenda, which obviously um, tackles many issues that are very important for the development of a society, for the development of a liberal and free society, and not a repressive society. And I think there's, of course, uh, still a lot to be done in Central Europe. Our foundation is named after Friedrich Ebert, which was the first German president after a long period of uh, rather undemocratic rule in Germany. And the name is our program that means the strengthening of democracy and democratic institutions and values that is the key issue of our engagement in Germany itself, in Europe, and if we can, also globally. And Poland and its civil society and its institutions, I would like to mention that here, are a very, very important partner uh, for us, have been a very important partner, I mean, already before the transformation, but for sure in the transformation. In an ideal state of affairs, Democracy would mean that all citizens, no matter where they come from or who they are, would have equal share in the political scene, but also in decision-making processes. Obviously, in Europe, that is not the case that everyone has equal share, and our job is to find ways how to, f to make this policy 
policy process and political process more just and more inclusive. As you all know, if you look at the political scene, the typical politician still is rather male and is rather uh, also refined to a particular age, namely between 40 and 60 or even sometimes even 70. And uh, just to give you some examples, 24% of the deputies in the Polish same are female in Germany you have 32% in the German Bundestag. We will have the up, the, I have old numbers, but then I leave room for developing the debate. And then I leave the numbers, then I just uh, uh, want to mention one. Obviously in Hungary, in the other Central European countries, you have other numbers. But what, and in Hungary we have the worst situation where we have under 10%. But what, what, what I want to say is obviously there is a lot to be done and we would like to discuss ways how this can be changed. And I'm very happy that we have a regional approach, that we have prof experts from Hungary, from Slovakia, from the Czech Republic and from Poland and from Germany. And I would thank you all very much for coming here, for discussing with us yesterday uh, the day before and today. I think that's a lot of, I mean, a, a strong commitment and I very much like that we have this regional cooperation and it's very special and I would like to thank my colleagues who make that happen. And I would like to thank you that you made the, the way here to Poland to have this discussion and I hope that we can make something out of it, that we can develop, develop together ideas, which instruments, legal instruments work best but also which soft instruments uh, might change attitudes, which voluntary initiatives are necessary to develop the political sphere in a different way so that we have equal participation and equal decision making. I'm very happy and that, that's, uh, I'm coming to, I would like to conclude saying that I'm very happy that my friend, Professor Hertha Dolblak Melin is here with us. We have worked together in many countries, and that you're here today is very special to me personally. But more important, I think you're a very uh, good speaker. She is a very good speaker um, to give us um, not only insight into the German experience, but also a more general perspective uh, on the theme that we are discussing. Hertha has a uh, several decades of political and academic experience. She has been a minister of justice and knows which problems a woman has to tackle entering a career and a political career and being successful in that. When you entered in the 70s, obviously, and you will talk about it, the situation in Germany was quite different when it came to gender equality, but also decision-making processes than it is today. It is for our party, the Social Democratic Party, Hertha Dolblak Melin has served as a vice chairman and was in 1988 the first ever woman elected to be the vice chairperson in the SPD. And she has fought for legal and for real and de facto equality of men and women in every political position you have had. And you have reflected on that also in many discussions, uh, not only in Germany, but also in China, in South Africa, and in the Arab world, and well, probably everywhere, <laughs> together with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And I don't know how many years you were in parliament, 40? I'll tell you. OK, <laughs> but many. So we are very much looking forward on your <laughs> reflections. And I would like to thank the Institute um, for Public Affairs, that we can do this project together. And I hope that at the end, our report that we will develop will have an impact on what, what we can do, not only in Poland, but also in Central Europe in general. So Hertha, we are very much looking forward to your um, keynote speech and then to the discussion we will have on the first panel. Thank you very much for being here. 
dear Mr. Kukarczyk, I hope I pronounce it well so that everyone <laughs> knows who, who I mean. Dear Knut, thank you very much for your very friendly remarks and uh, thank you all for participating in this most interesting conference and inviting me to give some, well, more or less overview introductory remarks uh, on this issue about uh, the state of women's affairs and the development of that. Uh, I am deeply uh, grateful, not only because I know Warsaw to be a wonderful city, I've been there, uh, well, some time, and I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, on these issues, but as well as, uh, let's say, women's issues where uh, some of the most important incentives, motives, and uh, responsibilities in my political life. Uh, I started uh, well, being in politics, first in student politics in the 60s at the Free University of Berlin, and afterwards uh, in my home region. Uh, this was is the south of uh, Germany, a very traditional, if wonderful, part of Germany. And uh, when I, uh, well, was first elected to parliament, it was in 1972. As I left parliament voluntarily, in 2009, uh, then you can see it was, uh, I was there for 37 years in the German parliament, in the parliamentary assembly uh, of the Council of Europe, and as a minister, a cabinet minister, in the, uh, well, different, uh, well, institutions of the Council of Europe. Since then, I'm working with the United Nations, uh, mostly with the uh, Human Rights Council, and with the EU, uh, mainly on human rights. Uh, you perhaps will have heard about or learned about this, uh, well, <laughs> disputed report on freedom and plurality of media. This is one of the products I was engaged in. And uh, so I'm really happy to be here because, well, being a lawyer, an international lawyer, teaching at the university is only one uh, of the legs. Uh, well, improving the situation legal conditions and factual conditions of life of women always was the other. And the reason of that, of course, lies in the uh, situation we had in Germany when I started thinking politically. If I tell this to my daughters or now to my grandchildren, they start laughing because they think I'm telling them fairy tales. If I uh, tell them, no, gender not only influenced your life, but it most certainly and most efficiently determined whether you got an education, which education you got, how far and to which level of, of education you could come. Religion, uh, well, the political attitude of your uh, family, the income and the family background were important. If your family had uh, no or only limited, uh, well, means, financial means, which most of the family had, of course, the boy got the education. And there were no schemes of state scholarships at that time. The first schemes, uh, well, arose in, uh, well, in the middle of the 60s after long fights, which were part of the students' movement uh, I participated in, I can say, with a lot of pride. But, and we were saying, uh, if you had, uh, if you were unlucky, and you were born as a Catholic girl, in a more rural region of Germany, your opportunity and chances well, were only to find a nice man, get married, and stay married. Uh, to uh, well, add some uh, well, other uh, well, uh, pictures, you must say there were very strict roles about women in public life and women and behavior. Let me give you a, a small example to that. When I was in high school, at the end of the 50s, pants for girls in schools were absolutely forbidden. Of course, we had segregated schools so for, for girls and boys, but uh, you were sent home if you had, uh, let's say, were clad in pants. And even in 69, a colleague, a very courageous lady, a member of the Bundestag, she dared uh, well, dressing into a very elegant pantsuit. And she got a, a disciplinary, uh, well, a reprimand by the Speaker of the House. 
uh, this one cannot imagine that to be reality, but it was reality. And uh, gender uh, equality at that time was a dream. Of course, if you look to the legal and the constitutional side of it, uh, it should have been reality since 1949, or let's say uh, at least since the, fourth, uh, the first of, of April 1953, after uh, this uh, intermediary class, uh, which you will know if you want that to know. But uh, the interesting thing is that reality was totally different. Let me give you some details. Uh, girls not only got a generally lower educational level, but uh, girls' education focused on so-called female uh, professions. These were the serving professions, social professions. They were kept out of, let's say, political power. They were kept out of public power. They were kept out, let's say, of disciplines leading to influential uh, well, posts, because this was regarded to be unfemale, as they told us. When I started uh, reading law uh, in 62, we were less than 6% of women in this field. And if you see the change today, it's much more than 50%. And uh, if, uh, if you look, let's say, to the legal side of it, always having in mind that the constitutional clause being at the top of the norm hierarchy should have changed the legal situation by then, there was no equality in law. There was no equal pay in, in the uh, labor situation. And uh, if I talk about the right of the husband in the 50s to give notice, meaning to cancel the employment contract of his wife in contrast to her will, well, uh, at least my daughters and, and grandkids, uh, they start, as I mentioned, to laugh. In politics and business, women had no say. If you look, let's say, to the number of the members uh, in parliament, in 1949, there were 6.8 percent of the members were female, 6.8. And uh, even this very low share lowered further, because when I started first time being elected to the parliament, it was in 72, as I mentioned before, they were 5.8, in spite of me, but they couldn't calculate me double. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now in the elections, there are more than 36% uh, of the members are women now. And uh, if you look, let's say, whether this is a similar development in all our political uh, well, wings or parties, there you can see that there are reasonable difference, but uh, similar uh, situations as well. Conservatives started by 7.7 .7 in 1949. They held this share a very, very long time, long times after social democrats had introduced the party quota, because we don't have a legal quota for the electoral law, but a party quota in 88. Uh, the conservatives at that time, when we managed to get this quota into our party statutes, it was really nice, and I'll tell you a, a little anecdote of that. Um, I'm not only acquainted, but uh, with Rita Süßmuth, she was at that time uh, the very famous leader of the women's union um, of the Conservative Party, but we are really friends because I like her very much and she likes me. She sent me a, a, a telegram Males were not in at that time, in 88, when we succeeded in, let's say, achieving the quota. And she said, wonderful, congratulations, you need it, we don't. <laughs> and uh, well, uh, at that time, I was, well, a bit amused uh, and partly angry. And I said, well, I'll tell you in some years. And you could wait for that, because 10 years after that, the conservatives, the women who had hoped they would get the same share as social democratic women in their, uh, let's say, uh, area, uh, they had to introduce that what they called the quorum. 
uh, well, something, well, tendentially similar to the quota, but uh, what I did was uh, congratulate her and send back the telegram from that time. <laughs> but <laughs> she was fair enough to read it loudly. <laughs> and <laughs> everyone laughed. So, but uh, now you can see uh, after uh, Merkel's victory this time, and this is the new, uh, well, updated number, uh, even the conservatives moved from under 30% to 36% uh, female members in their parliamentary group, which is quite an achievement, I have to say that. One does not have to like Mrs. Merkel, I don't. But uh, uh, of course she is good, let's say, for women politics because she is a role model even for conservative women. One has to say that, and Social Democrats were, at the beginning, were not much better. They were 9.8 uh, 9 in, uh, in, uh, in 49, were down to 6.4 uh, after 125 years of their existence. In, in, no, uh, in 72, they were down 6.4. And uh, they elected the first woman to be a vice president of the party after 125 years of their existence. One has to see the dimensions. And uh, there you can see we were very uneasy and we said, no, no, we want to, uh, well, live ourselves in times where gender balance in politics is a normal thing. This was one of the, uh, let's say, the reasons why we fought before <coughs> and afterwards. If we are looking, let's say, to the smaller parties, you will find the Greens and the leftists, they have a better share of women. One has to say that uh, the liberals had a better share, but uh, they went uh, gradually down before now uh, they were uh, well elected out of uh, parliament. But now let, let us have a look to those areas which are, let's say, the fundament of political influence. Uh, this is economy, and it's, of course, uh, high jobs in civil service. If you look into civil service, uh, there, the, let's say, the change ordered by our constitution should have happened long before, but it didn't. Because uh, uh, the, the facts were stronger than the legal commitments. You see, we have not only the equality clause in our constitution, but we have uh, the very famous clause number 33 that says that you have to have equal access to jobs in civil service only uh, by merit uh, and uh, by qualification. And let's say you could see that women, women's examinations were bitter, higher than those of, of their male colleagues, but nevertheless, despite of that, the judges' councils always said, no, one cannot consider only those notes, qualifications and merits, but we can't appoint too many women because we have to consider their presumable pregnancies and family obligations. Uh, this very famous quote was said by a high-ranking, uh, let's say, president of a judges' council at the beginning of the 80s, and shamefully, this was a social democrat in the north. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but uh, you see, in all that, you can find a different, uh, let's say, element of uh, Nazi ideology, of very conservative and traditional structures. And you will understand that in those times, in those times before uh, the implosion of the Soviet uh, Union, and of course the independence uh, of the middle, uh, central, and eastern European states. We were looking full of admiration to Poland at that time, being one of the uh, first to move along. Uh, we looked before that time uh, beyond the Iron Wall, because that what we could see as women seemed to be much better. Uh, job security, equal pay, uh, job careers, lots of uh, uh, child care institutions, mostly uh, adequate, even at least in the former GDR, the abortion laws were less an affair for criminal justice than they were in the, in, in the West. Uh, we compared that to that what we had to do and uh, what we saw 
as, as we had to fight for everything and against everything. And uh, as, work, as working mothers, we always had to si decide between meeting the more or less loud reproach to be a bad mother or an uh, unreliable career woman with uh, permanent remorses and self-remorses included. And instead of supportive institutions for childcare, we had uh, the Mother's Day. We found that a bit unjust. And uh, this, of course, uh, was an obstacle um, for seeing the whole picture. I know that quite well. So we more or less generously overlooked a lot of problems existing there um, in uh, the Eastern states. And of course, uh, there were a lot of traditions that compromised uh, the full equality of women there as well. So uh, today, of course, we can see that there were uh, m very few women in politically influential uh, positions and in the leading circles of the parties, uh, of the leading parties, you couldn't find them uh, neither. And uh, if you look, let's say, to big institutions or big companies uh, the, uh, of the state-owned companies, uh, these are those that I mean there were not many women at that time. Today, I think we know a bit more about the achievements and flaws in detail. But we have uh, seen that there are lots of interesting tendencies that could have, that should have, let's say, been saved through transformation. And I know quite well that transformation uh, had, uh, uh, well, had big hopes for women. But lots of them uh, were not only disappointed, but really destroyed. Of course, not everywhere in the European countries becoming uh, well more and more independent and uh, sooner or later members of the Council of Europe and then of the European Union. But uh, the, the, if you look east, you can see that uh, mainly in Central Asia, there one can say very clearly that women were the losers of the transformation. And there are a lot of elements which you uh, can find in parts of other countries as well, uh, meaning that women's organizations got no longer uh, financial support, uh, uh, meaning uh, that traditions, family structures, all um, male, uh, well, over or seemingly overcome structures uh, came along again and arose. So the situation down there is not very nice for women. I could follow uh, very closely the changes uh, of unification, of transformation. Uh, you know, this... Uh, process was majored by a very stable uh, conservative majority. But uh, saying this, I have to say, it could have been a different outcome if women in East and West had, had learned to cooperate, which was not the case. Uh, let me uh, give you, therefore, <laughs> a, a, a very small anecdote. In the GDR, we know quite well uh, that women played a huge role in the civil society revolution, not only in organizing it. It was not only a, a question of courage, but uh, it was as well uh, in the direction of the political course, being peaceful about the proposals that were made uh, and all of this. And uh, we, uh, uh, social democratic women, we tried in the autumn of 89 to join forces with them. We met quite a lot of them, were very uh, impressed by that, by those personalities of these uh, women. And uh, we asked them, how can we support you? And how uh, could we join forces in East and West? Because we felt that uh, the uh, different conditions of a market society uh, would change quite a lot. And you could see that the, uh, the economic base, uh, it was very clear that there was no chance of, let's say, surviving. And uh, all uh, the conditions together with that were very clear as well. But we were really, uh, well, uh, set 
back, we were very disappointed when they bluntly told us no. Uh, if you want to support uh, the civil society movement, that's why, fine, and you are very welcome. But organizing uh, women's cooperation in East and West is not necessary. We don't need that. You need that in the West. We don't need that. We are part of the civil society movement. It's quite clear that we will stay in this role even after unification. We try to convince them, to tell them a bit about, let's say, conditions of a market society, about competition and what's going on in that situation. But they, didn't be, they simply didn't believe us. And the interesting thing uh, was a very bitter one, uh, the experience that after six months, most of them had disappeared. No jobs, no money, no chances, no opportunity. The jobs that were there were occupied by their male competitors. Even Angela Merkel was not on the agenda, as you know, at that time. She was uh, a helper of uh, the conservative, uh, well, uh, leader of the first free elected parliament, uh, Ulrich de Maizière. Well, so uh, we had to start anew in the 90s. And uh, this, let's say, fight for gender equality in all fields, in the legal field, in the political field, in uh, the labor market, and in the business field, uh, followed the old ideological lines. Uh, so it was always more progressive parties against uh, the uh, conservatives. One, you could see that in the legal changes we had that rate, uh, well, uh, uh, domestic violence, uh, family law, uh, you name it, in every case. Today, we can see a different situation as far as I am aware. You see, uh, I'm, as Knut pointed out, well, working in quite a lot of countries. And the interesting thing is that you can see that more and more uh, international tendencies, institutions, but uh, well, uh, powerful women start telling the public about, uh, well, how important gender balance and gender equality is. This is new, because I'm sure you will not have heard any quota of Mrs. Merkel, let's say, on women's affairs, because this is not her thing. She's important because she's doing it, but she never understood herself to be someone uh, with a, uh, the special, let's say, intention to improve the conditions of women. And uh, I think that Christine Lafarge, uh, she mm -hmm. is the managing uh, the director of the International Monetary Fund in France during her time as a minister of finance, uh, played about the same role. So I find it rather remarkable that she is writing articles uh, you can find in all newspapers all over the globe and I found it in China last week, and she demands a greater role for women in economy, and criticizing uh, in the same place that women's progress has stalled dis despite of some improvements, and giving the reason for her proposal and her demand that the relation between gender equality and gender balance and stable society is quite visible, and uh, that gender equality is necessary for development of national global economy and stable societies. I found this really remarkable. And uh, what I brought uh, with me again was the newest edition of Harvard Business <laughs> Review. <laughs> they dedicate that to the gender balance question in politics and business. Because yeah, they are saying this becomes more and more important and uh, they uh, well are asking why is uh, the improvement not going as fast as it should, and where are the reasons, where are the obstacles, how to overcome them. Of course, we know quite well that the European Union and other international institutions are quite helpful in promoting uh, gender equality and gender balance. Um, and that's why I won't, let's say, uh, go into that in detail, because we all, I think, around the table know this quite well. But I'll give you a, a bit at the end of my overview, I'll give you some uh, uh, idea about the discussions we have in Germany now. Uh, w the gender question is on the agenda, no doubt about that. 
but it has a very special focus. It, it's more uh, the uh, business, the economic focus. And uh, it's interesting why this is so. It's so because there are a lot of fields where the improvements uh, we achieved are quite visible, one has to say that. First thing is, of course, uh, the, political, um, the, the political picture. Uh, I mentioned the member of parliaments. I'd like, and, and of course our uh, female chancellor, I'd like to, to mention that four of our 16 uh, regional state leaders are women now. Um, it's only one quarter, but it's a quarter. And uh, that, let's say, uh, forming a government cabinet without at least 40% women would be out of the world. It would be subject to criticism, not only by women and women's organizations, but uh, by the public, because yes. this is not done anymore. And interesting, it's interesting uh, that uh, the criticism that one uh, quarter uh, is not enough because this is not yet normal, is not raised in, in Germany. Uh, nobody talks about that because I only can explain this because they expect that uh, more and more women will come into power, let's say, in, uh, at the top of big cities, of uh, uh, regional states, or even as ministers. Secondly, uh, the improvement of ed in the educational fields are really there. Not only scholarships, not only, let's say, first and secondary education, but as well at the university level, uh, there is a lot of improvement. But there are uh, sites that have to be improved, no doubt about that. It is absolutely clear that, let's say, careers in, at the university level, to be university professor has to be supported much better. And so this is one focus of discussion at the moment. Secondly, uh, let's say, uh, the concentration of, uh, let's say, some former, we call them female, uh, let's say, faculties is still there. Not as uh, tight as it was at my time, but let's say there are uh, well, we need much more uh, girls, let's say, for sciences and uh, studying uh, uh, computer sciences, things like that. This is not enough. One of the biggest gaps you can see in economy and labor market, and I'll give you some examples for that. Equal pay, of course, is legally required by national law, by international law, by EU law. Uh, this is quite evident, but nevertheless, if you look to that, not on the individual side, but on the statistical side, you will find that women are grotesquely underpaid. They are getting 26% uh, less than women, uh, than men, and the interesting thing is we are below the average in the European Union with that. Why is this so? It's a, an outcome of the traditional family structures and the lack of, let's say, childcare institutions and uh, the not yet fully, uh, let's say, adapted legal tools. So women are underrepresented in well-paid full-time jobs, but they are hugely overrepresented in atypically badly paid part-time limited and low career jobs. Uh, this makes the difference between the individual equal pay and the statistically underpaid. And uh, so you will find most of those Germans that are dependent of uh, public subsidies are women. And you will find uh, that the most of those who have no sufficient pension in old age, poverty is female, are women. And despite of merit and their proved qualifications, there are nearly no women at the top of big companies. Uh, you will find some, Friede Springer, with a uh, uh, Springer uh, edition, uh, or the, uh, well, uh, publishing newspaper house. and publishing uh, company, and others, Mohn, Quant, Piech, Wirt, uh, they all are either widows of the founders or the daughters of the owners. So uh, you can't say that there is a progress or improvement in this field. Uh, what are the reasons for that? Boys networking is number one. They are simply better. And women uh, have not the same self-esteem 
and have not realized that they have to take empowerment in an, uh, let's say, in, a, in a enough. This is, I think, one of the big tasks of the young generation. And secondly, this is a, a very, uh, let's say, disturbing situation that uh, the one-sided responsibility for families is still with women. And it's not only, let's say, in the public thinking like that or in the individual thinking, but it's even in the legal rules. And the legal rules we can change. Because uh, what can we do? I think uh, parental leave has to be shared equally. And this has to be mandatory, which it is not at the moment. Secondly, we have to change uh, the labor laws concerning part-time job flexibility for men and women, which is not the case at the moment. Uh, thirdly, we have to create much more institutions to be there and available for childcare, uh, open for fathers and mothers. But you see, uh, the fight is going on. You will see in the next government, we have a huge fight about the third point, which I just mentioned, or the questions to give subsidies uh, to those families who do not give their kids into existing childcare institutions. So uh, this is, I think, an interesting thing. And uh, it should be added by, let's say, quota in the business field uh, well, regarding uh, management boards and supervisory boards. Uh, this all will be on the agenda in the next years. But let me come to my conclusion. To summarize, uh, summarize all, I'd say uh, that in gender affairs, our experience is one can change quite a lot. Uh, in looking, let's say, into the tools and experiences of others, we did that, you do that, uh, you are discussing this, but nothing in gender affairs is granted for eternity. And uh, this I couldn't imagine when I was your age. <laughs> but I've learned that, that you have to adapt it uh, to the conditions in every era and in every, let's say, uh, government system which we are. In our uh, system, a lot of change was possible. But the way to gender equality, to fairness in implementation and in, in balance in implementation uh, is long and there are quite a lot of uh, things to do. I think the most important thing is, let's say, supporting uh, education and self-esteem of uh, girls and women and their capability to cooperate. But let me uh, uh, well conclude uh, with a quota of Willy Brandt, which I love very much. And uh, I thought that uh, Knut would take it. That's why I have not written down it, <laughs> but I'll say that. He was a very wise man. And he said, if you really want to achieve the humane society, you have to overcome the male one. And I think he is quite right. You see, in German, uh, you have some play with words. Again, uh, you don't have that in the, in the English version of that, but it's true nevertheless. So now I thank you very much for your patience and for your listening. And now I'm very interested in the following discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. This was most informational and most inspira inspirational keynote speech, I think an excellent introduction to our discussions today. Uh, so I will now hand over to uh, the uh, moderation of the panel to Marcin Walecki, who is the Chief of Democratic Governance and Gender Unit at the Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights based here in Warsaw. And, uh, with whom we, we did quite a lot of work together on, on advancing some of the solutions, addressing the problem of absence of women from politics. So, Marcin, please take over. Thank you. Thank you, Jacek. And, and Professor, once again, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much indeed for this very inspirational talk and for reminding us that uh, gender is not only influencing, but also determining our lives. Um, I also want to apologize um, as you can see clearly, the construction sector in Poland is not very gender friendly, uh, but I want to assure you that they can try hard, but they will not stop us. We have a very important panel here, and I am extremely grateful uh, 
to welcome um, four very distinguished experts, scholars. And before we actually start discussing uh, legal arrangements, legal mechanisms, those uh, special measures, I want to go back very briefly to the point our keynote speaker made. Um, entering politics in 72, 5.8% of women. Politics in Germany now, you see 36% of women in, in parliaments. But when you look at our region, OEC region, the picture is not uh, yet that positive. Uh, in fact, the research which we done together with Professor Pippa Norris from Harvard University, and you can get a copy of our recent publication, points out that if we continue with those recent trends, it will take us at least 50 years in the OEC region to achieve full gender equality in politics, and globally, 150 years. This is not only shocking, but it's completely unacceptable. We cannot wait to have three generations of women leaders to be blocked from entering politics. And moreover, if you look at our own region, Visegrad countries, it doesn't look like any of the countries will actually reach the Beijing target of 2015, which is the critical mass of 30%. So with those figures, I just want to remind you that the fight for gender equality in politics is certainly not over, and I'm only help, very grateful, and, and we are all privileged to have a role models like you, Professor, and uh, we will take your ideas uh, and your thoughts uh, in our future fight for gender equality. So I will stop now and I will um, introduce our speakers. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Reka Varni. I had a privilege to listen to her presentation recently in uh, Budapest, um, leading uh, expert on gender equality in Hungary. Um, we will take about 10 minutes for each presentation and after that, we will open a discussion. Um, we will welcome questions related to the keynote presentation as well to the presentations made by our panelists. So, Dr. Varni, the floor is yours. Thank you. May I use your microphone? So, I would like to uh, welcome everybody. I'm really pleased to be here and talk about gender issues. Although when Marcin asked me how much time would I need for my presentation, I was really hesitant about either saying 10 minutes or one minute, because to summarize uh, the situation in Hungary, uh, it would be really easy. You know, we have no gender quota and no hope for one. Thank you for your attention. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> actually, the, unfortunately, the situation is very close to, to what I'm saying uh, right now. Well, uh, we do have gender quota, except it's a voluntary one within parties. As you are all, I guess you are all familiar with the international uh, trends, so I don't have to explain uh, for a long time about uh, the fact that uh, the socialist and the liberal parties seem to be more open toward gender equality and gender quotas. So the voluntary gender quota we have is within, one is within the socialist party, the other is within a new green party that entered the parliament at the last elections for the first time and then seems not going to do that again at the next one. So we are um, kind of stuck with the voluntary gender code of the social that is applied, how to say it politically correctly, very voluntarily, as it is a voluntary quota. So it's a 20% quota that is uh, respected on the list at some times, but not always. And it's not a zipper quota, so it tends to uh, put women at the end of the party list. All the other parties, the conservative parties and the center parties, when we had some, and the liberals, they do not have quotas. There had been attempts to introduce quotas to the Hungarian system, namely three of them. And I think it's important to get to know them a bit because they show a nice trend within Hungarian politics and, and Hungarian society. The first attempt was in 2007 when uh, two liberal MPs attempted to introduce two bills about quotas, one for party lists and the other one is for women in government. And finally, they have failed. The second attempt was through a referendum in 2010, failed again. And the last attempt was in 2011. Uh, and this last attempt is very curious because the bill was presented by a far-right-wing MP together with a Green MP. 
something really unheard of in uh, Hungarian politics and failed again. Why are these important? Yesterday we had a small workshop talking about gender issues and gender quotas, and I heard a fascinating story about Poland, about the importance of critical moments mm -hmm. to, to do something, to, to make change happen. And uh, I'm, I'm very sad to realize, and my colleagues might uh, agree with me, that we missed that opportunity in Hungary. As in 2007, when the, uh, there was a um, debate about the quota system and a wider debate about the, the gender question in Hungary, parties were not decided yet. So if you look at what happened to the quota within the parliament, one third of MPs abstained from voting because the fractions, the parties, did not have a hard line about how to vote. So the conservative and the socialist did not tell their own MPs how <coughs> to vote about the quota, but left at their consciousness. And I think it tells a lot about politics, that in this case, about not told what to do, they just prefer not to do anything and don't push a button. That's always better, you know, that's more safe. So one third of MPs did not push a button. And around 10% of MPs in the conservative era said yes, and uh, I have the exact numbers, uh, half of the socialist MPs said yes, <coughs> but uh, around 10% uh, uh, of the socialist MPs said no, and around 30% uh, of conservative MPs said no. So there was really, uh, on the other hand, there was no, uh, there was a, a lack of consensus about the quota, which is of course sad. But on the other hand, there was a little bit space to move around, especially because when the initiative failed, the five parties present in parliament decided to come together and discuss the possibilities for introducing the quota system. Uh, I think this example is very telling because we, I had a, a very uh, kind colleague of mine and friend of mine, Jofia Papp, who did a deeper analysis of that voting. And it turned out that MPs who got their seats in single member district voted more preferably, voted yes towards the quota, mm -hmm. which shows clearly that people who got their mandates on party lists were rather frightened for their own position. And their solution was, you know, uh, to suggest that we should not the quota on Hungarian politics because it's too drastic, but should introduce some measures to increase women within the far future when I will be out of politics and don't have to earn money uh, uh, for my family there. But they were open actually to introduce some kind of quota system with uh, increasing women percentage in politics, and we did not grab that that uh, point. We did not jump on, on, on the scene to change politics. And at the last time in 2011, when again a bill was introduced, actually all the conservative uh, party, everybody, every MP voted against it. And which is again more in, uh, again interesting, everybody from the far right wing party, whose MP was in the introducing of the bill, voted against it. What does it tell us? It tells us uh, what uh, one of our researchers discovered doing interviews with women and men within the parliament, that the only solution they can think of is a military coup to introduce quota. Like it's not something feasible through negotiation and incremental change and changing public attitude. Everything we talk here about, no? that these, these issues should come to the surface and we should see how and when and where. No, no, they have a totally different idea. They think you should do a military coup here, introduce a bill and somehow present it as unavoidable. So everybody has to answer yes. And you should make no compromise, not even within your own party, because then it fails. So if you somehow invite everybody to put their interest and their opinion, then you are going to, what they say about politics, then you are going to uh, create a committee to talk about the issue which kills it off quite efficiently, actually. So uh, uh, this is uh, 
This is where we stand in Hungary. We are waiting for the right moment to have a military coup, uh, which uh, which is, seems quite radical. But but that's uh, that's um, the that's the seemingly that's the solution that uh, the political elite uh, can imagine, despite of the fact that public public opinion is not against the issue. So around 50, more than 50% of Hungarian women and men think there should be more women in politics. And they accept the idea of quota. So a lot of times it's suggested that because of its communist past, quotas are from evil within Hungarian society because quota was applied by uh, the system before. But it's simply not true. Public opinion is not at all against the quota. Well, it's not actually for the quota either in a sense that public is more or less indifferent towards uh, the issue. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to propose some suggestions or, or shall we listen to the situation I, I, in other countries? One thing which I would love to hear from you, mm -hmm. you have one minute left uh, still, no, I mean, reca in, uh, reminding mm -hmm. our guests that we have in current representation is 8.8% of women in parliament, 8.8%. Yes. It's the lowest among all the OEC countries, way below Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. Yeah, I'm um, proud of that. I and, to avoid uh, that number, uh, and, and the question is, <laughs> you have elections next year. Very yes. briefly, what, what are you expecting as an outcome of um, this election? Things can be worse. <laughs> can be worse Everything yes. can, can turn worse. Uh, actually, gender issue is not, not on the platform. Maybe it, it will be present. So there is a niche. It, it, might, uh, it might be presented by opposition uh, parties as an issue, and the Socialist Party is, uh, is uh, one of the suspects to bring it on with the existing voluntary gender quotas. But opinion polls show that uh, right now the conservative side is in the winnable position. So that's on the party side. And uh, also, I don't know how familiar you are with the Hungarian system, but an electoral reform. Uh, is on its way, so the next elections will be carried out under a new framework, which has a much stronger majority and side included in it. So party lists, uh, there will be less mandate winnable, uh, not only in numbers, because the number of MPs is shrinking quite, uh, quite a bit. So not only the number, but the percentage of mandates uh, winnable on party lists is going to shrink, which, according to international data, uh, predicts a disadvantage for women. Although I have to, have to tell you that, that the Hungarian research show that party lists are, are not more advantageous to women. Mm -hmm. So SMDs, women are, are, are strong in SMDs as well, which I could translate as if you have a resource for politically strong women, they can even run in SMDs, except that just there are very few of them. So the gatekeep gatekeeping goes back to candidate selection. And it's not truly about the entering the electoral system, but about, about candidate selection. Mm -hmm. So I'm not predicting anything. Anything nice and good. Thank you very much indeed. And as I said, there will be opportunity to ask questions yeah. at the end of our panel. So it is my pleasure now to give a floor to Ms. Veronika Spinchova from 50% from Czech Republic, Prague. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. And uh, thank you for the invitation to all of you. And I'm really surprised in a way how many people I can see there because I think it's one of the differences within the region because in the Czech Republic I cannot imagine so many people uh, coming to, to share the ideas about women in politics. Or maybe I'm too skeptical, but I've never seen this, so <laughs> I'm quite surprised. And my impression uh, for, for this input is very the same, like Jureka said, that I can say there one sentence, that in the Czech Republic we don't have any legal mechanisms, and I really don't think we will have any in, in the future or in some soon future. Uh, and uh, what I think is maybe worse than in the other countries is that uh, this particular topic has never been uh, on the agenda, actually. Uh, there was one proposal, one bill, uh, prepared by the Ministry of Internal Affairs, but it was uh, never even submitted because it was prepared in uh, th uh, 2010, and after the elections, uh, the conservative government was, uh, was um, appointed, 
and it was male only, so it was uh, 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 possible to predict this male only government uh, wouldn't vote for gender quotas. So it was uh, put back in a drawer and it, it's still there, probably. Uh, we also have only one party with uh, a gender quota for, for the candidate lists for, for ballots, and it's the Green Party, uh, which is not currently um, uh, represented in the lower house. Uh, they have one senator, a woman, but it's the only one person in the whole parliament. Uh, what's maybe showing some way uh, is the Communist Party, which is very centralized, and then they don't use a quota for, for uh, the ballots, but they have a recommendation, and they follow this recommendation, is that they should have one woman at least to the third place on the candidate list. And uh, they have 40% in, in the lower house, or they had because uh, the lower house was dismissed and there will be elections in a month. And it's quite the same in Hungary. I can't uh, say that uh, we will see some positive results in a month after the election. Uh, before that, in uh, three years ago, after the election, a record number of women were elected. It was 22%. But when you look at the number, uh, it's very important to say that 14 out of 44 uh, deputies, female deputies, uh, get that mandate uh, thanks to preferential votes. The preferential voting became stronger because uh, before these elections, and therefore one third of all the female deputies uh, were uh, elected uh, thanks to direct support from voters. And there were very huge campaign to, uh, to give preferential votes to candidates not on the top positions because the public a consensus was that those people are corrupted and shouldn't be there. So uh, many people gave their preferential votes to candidates on the bottom on the list. Uh, in the, the other elections, everyone, uh, did, no one w uh, wanted to be on the top position. It was quite paradox because normally everyone wants to be the leader, but the leader was <laughs> the uh, the worst position in in the next election. It was quite a paradox, I would say. And uh, I think that uh, what's really true for the Czech politics uh, is what uh, sociologist Hanna Havelkova uh, writes in one of, her, in one of uh, her paper, and it's that the situation of women in Czech politics is like a lottery. You never know what will be the outcome before uh, the election, and you never know which parties will get to the parliament, I would say, in, in last years, and it's very hard to guess how many women will be there. Uh, we know how the candidate lists look for, for the uh, elections, uh, which will be in, in um, October, and it looks that uh, the biggest parties nominated even less women than uh, in, the, in the last election, so I really can't say that there will be a big progress, and I really don't think that preferential voting is some uh, stable mechanism how to get more women into politics. Uh, what I think is really important in uh, in the relation to promote uh, promoting women and to promote some legal mechanism is the overall discourse, because uh, what I think is quite a paradox as well is that uh, when you look in the media, you think that no one wants gender quota, be it business or politics. On the other hand, we have uh, public opinion polls showing that more than half of the population is in favor of these legal measures. In case of uh, uh, business, it was about 78%, uh, I guess, and uh, in case of politics, it was 58% of people being in favor of these legal mechanisms. So there is somewhere, there is some mistake in the, in the system uh, that the media discourse is completely different than uh, what's uh, really in the society or what the public opinion uh, polls show. And another thing is, uh, in relation to this, uh, is that uh, I think you have to start in some point and submit the proposal, uh, uh, some legal mechanisms, because uh, then you start the discussion, and I think it was the case of uh, many um, of many countries. Um, uh, 
I don't uh, talk whether they have actually have quotas or not, but I think that you have to do this first step. I think that in the Czech politics we have experience with uh, gay marriages, or we call it registered partnership, of uh, gays and lesbians. And this proposal, this law, was uh, submitted, I think, like four or five times. But uh, any time, uh, you always shift the discourse a bit. And then some moment comes, and uh, the 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 uh, the bell passes, and we never started with gender quotas. And I think it's it's time to do this to start to make the first step uh, with uh, uh, with no big expectations. But I think that maybe the fourth fifth time will work. Uh, again, I don't know whether to add some some. Mm, positive um, uh, uh, advices how to promote more women in politics. I think we have many, many studies uh, from different countries, and I think that we all know that it's very good to have some networks of women to support women within parties. But uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, some, some legal mechanisms, some, uh, some common environment for all the parties uh, coming from the state, this top-down uh, procedure is, is very important, and I'm not much sure that uh, if we rely on particular political parties, uh, which are changing, uh, it's, it's not, very, not very stable mechanisms, and I'm really looking forward to uh, the other experiences and for your question at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Veronika. Um, it is my pleasure now to give the floor to Professor Darina Malova, Faculty of Philosophy, Comenius University, Bratislava. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the floor and also for opportunity to be here in Poland. For me, it's a unique opportunity to learn more, more about Polish experience, but also uh, kind of uh, initiate a small group of my students. Four of them, they decided last year to write MA thesis on uh, gender issue or uh, legislative rules in Visegrad uh, countries. And uh, uh, I perceive it as a small victory because even if they are, they are only four of them, it's a good message that they have a serious academic interest and they want to learn how come that after 20 years of democratic regime or democratization process, I shouldn't go too far, uh, we still have a uh, very low proportion of women in the politics. Uh, it ranged between 12%, it was immediately in 1990, maximum to 18% in the parliament. At the local level, at uh, best times, we had 28%. Uh, so as you can see, it's not uh, enough. And uh, sometimes when I was uh, frustrated uh, at the international conferences, I was told by my Polish colleague, uh, okay, but at least you have very decent legal rules over the uh, pro-choice uh, or abortion movement. So yes, that's true. We had an uh, excellent uh, experience with uh, domestic violence, uh, mm, the movement against domestic violence, which was very successful. So civil society in Slovakia is active. But this is the end of uh, good news or good message. Because if I should speak about legal mechanism increasing women, uh, women's participation, then uh, first, it's very low. The participation is very low. Uh, we do not have any uh, quotas. In the past, uh, right now we have six parties in the parliament. None of the parties has uh, a voluntary or informal quota. In the past, we had only two parties uh, which applied them. And of course, there is no legal sanction mechanism. So. Those uh, were just Potemkin's villages because they really did not function. The former uh, party of democratic uh, left, which is uh, uh, no more basically uh, existing in Slovakia, the, uh, the aim was 20% on the party list. But they, uh, mm, 
succeeded in promoted, uh, promoting only 14 of them. It was, it was uh, at the turn of uh, millennium. So uh, I do not want to compete with Hungary or Czech Republic how, uh, how uh, worse uh, or the, the, the things uh, are uh, worse in Slovakia, but I have this uh, feeling. More, uh, on top of it, the economic crisis hit Slovakia very hard in 2008, and this discourse, the economic crisis discourse really damaged the gender uh, perception, the uh, gender mainstreaming in Slovakia. Uh, if I should uh, fo follow the structure of my colleague, basically the public is uh, less supportive uh, to uh, any kind of legislative or um, voluntary quotas than in Czech Republic or in uh, Hungary. Um, only 28% uh, in uh, 2011 supported the party's voluntary quotas, and only 20% of the public, this is according to Eurobarometer uh, research, supported the legislative quota, only 20%. Uh, and when it comes to the representation, equal representation in business, only 16% of Slovaks, they support Vivian Redding's initiative. So uh, as you see, there is not a very friendly environment. Uh, despite of these um, data and facts, I would like to start uh, with a, uh, or continue with a simple and maybe provocative thesis. I don't think that the quotas alone are sufficient to ensure high uh, levels of women in the parliament. Moreover, a high level of representation could also be achieved without quotas. Uh, just because we have basically here two discourses after Beijing. Uh, first is kind of gradual incremental uh, track versus the fast track procedures, uh, meaning uh, do it in a Scandinavian way or German, at least German way, build a civil society organization, organize the movement, then you will reach uh, the high representation or, or higher representation of, of women in politics. Or do introduce fast track, that means legislative quota, and of course you can get into serious troubles. I'm not talking about all dangers of introducing uh, legal quotas in countries which are not prepared for them. Uh, we can uh, maybe uh, discuss it uh, uh, later on. Uh, I would like to raise just two more uh, issues. Uh, if I am in favor of this gradual approach, uh, it doesn't imply that I am ready to wait for 50 years because I don't have 50 years in front of me, uh, or at least I doubt that I have. Uh, uh, so I just want to stress uh, two uh, ideas. First, uh, the representation, equal representation of women is not a f the final goal. We will not be hap uh, happy ever after we reach the equal representation. It's basically the final goal, it's empowering the woman. And uh, let's say any kind of solution, be it voluntary, informal, or formal quotas, it's only a way how to empower women. And uh, when I'm talking about uh, empowering, uh, this is second uh, point I, I would like to shape in, uh, in kind of uh, feminist uh, discourse. This is uh, very often we, we heard in the past about supply, uh, demand and supply logic, uh, saying, OK, in our countries, there is really very little or less demand uh, for uh, women empower, empowerment, not only representation. But the problem, in my opinion, is also in supply side. This is probably the main uh, problem. So with my students, we look a little bit closer in this uh, supply side. And uh, what we discovered, <coughs> psychological or subjective barrier, which is put by uh, Slovak women 
in voluntary way, when we interview young politicians, we ask them, uh, or young leaders, young intellectuals, we ask them, uh, like, why are you against quota? They, uh, because you, the, the very typical answer was, because you can be again the representation in case that you are smart enough, uh, you are willing to work at least uh, twice harder uh, than men, uh, then you can uh, get your life uh, in a way you wish. Uh, even with these uh, girly uh, dreams, having a nice man, good job, kids, and also a professional career. Uh, and when I ask these uh, young women, how come that you put this additional barrier if uh, where there are no, uh, not enough structural barriers? I mean, uh, the women are discriminate, uh, discriminated. We know all these structural barriers. And on top of it, women, at least in Slovakia, they put the subjective psychological barrier on themselves. And they are even proud that they are uh, able to work uh, twi uh, twice as hard as men. So this is something I really do not understand. Then uh, probably the end of the, uh, my story uh, would be always I um, tell them, uh, look at the Slovak parliament. Look at uh, how many men they are. And please name, uh, name me at least two men who can fulfill all these requirements. So the, this problem of inequality, which was basically imposed on us uh, is voluntarily accepted uh, by women. And uh, this is, for me, probably right now the, the biggest research puzzle, how to uh, explain this, but also to, uh, to find ways uh, to answer the question, what shall be done? Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor, and I think uh, this also builds a nice bridge with our next panel. I think we all agree that critical mass is not enough. We also need to talk about critical power and critical decisions. So it's not only the numbers, but actually how women can then get the positions uh, which allow them to exercise the power and make decisions which are actually enforcing gender equality. I have a very high hopes for Professor Fushara for your uh, presentation because Poland is the only country in Visegrad uh, group um, with the legal mechanisms. Um, and I hope we can go back to our fundamental question of this panel to really talk about how to evaluate the effectiveness of such a legal mechanisms, what are the lessons from, from Polish experience, and is Poland ready for the next generation of legal mechanisms, my favorite topic, the issue of public funding of political parties. You know, should we go uh, by the example of France, Ireland, Serbia, Georgia, and link allocation of public funding to political parties with the women representation? So we experimented with quotas. We would all like to hear from you how successful this experiment was, and are there opportunities for other legal mechanisms which we could introduce in Poland? Professor, if the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's very hard to evaluate the result of the introducing quota, taking into consideration that there was only one election after introducing quota, and only to the parliament. Uh, we are before the local election, when the first time, and to European election, and in both of them, there will be the first time a quota on the electoral lists. But the story in Poland is different in this sense, that we tried to introduce quota since many years, at the big end, it was three types of attempts. There was more attempts, but three types of attempts. The first was introduce the kind of quota into general act of equal opportunity. It was in 90s, and many of this effort was it was taken by member of parliaments. In this time, it was mainly from the let's say social democrat. But uh, this, it was very, in this time, quite powerful uh, woman caucus in Polish parliament when they tried to build women in the parliament, try to build it, let's say, from many uh, women from many political parties, try to build the, the common agenda for introducing gender equality act 
and part of them it was a kind of quota, not only for the electoral list but for all offices as well. But the draft was many times rejected in Polish parliament and the second attempt, mainly thanks to women organizations in Pol Poland, was taken before election in 2000 and there was a big discussion and big mobilization between the <coughs> women organizations in Poland to increase the number of women in parliament and with some success because it was the first moment when it decreased from 13 to 20 percent but uh, quota was not introduced as a legal mechanism into electoral system but was introduced in this time by some political parties uh, but these parties after some time majority of them resigned from quota but this is the, the, the uh, again the story that something you achieve nev is never forever. You have to be very careful because it have it, it can disappear after some time. Uh, and I thought after this experience in 2000 that it's probably will be like in Czech Republic and in, like in Hungary that this is end of this effort. We cannot introduce quota in Poland. There is no way to do it, especially when some parties who previously introduced quota resigned from this. But uh, last year there was other uh, other attempts, and uh, the the most I think uh, well known is attempt to taken by Congress of Women in two thousand nine. But we should remember that uh, there was. Uh, uh, there was many other, let's say, signs that something is going on in Poland around the problem of uh, of one participation in politics. Uh, there was uh, um, in 2000 the, when the left government was in power, uh, Ministry of uh, Gender Equality. It was uh, Isabela Jaruganowska and Magdalena Środa after her. They built, the, let's say, the governmental mechanism all over country and they begin to train women in the countryside. And I think that this is very significant to uh, to introduce, let's say, the, to uh, the, the why we could succeed in 2010 because nothing is is uh, can happen t overnight. Uh, it's very hard to imagine that quota can be just introduced without s this this uh, work bef done before. And uh, 2009 was crucial in this sense that uh, it was a celebration of uh, 20 anniversary of the first free election in Poland. And as I always underline, uh, we as a woman suddenly discover that we are invited to celebrate it, uh, but as somebody who is supposed to listen. The men were supposed to speak how brave they were, how heroistic they were, how they win and how they overcome this, the communist past and how they change everything in our country. But we as a woman were supposed to listen to the men's story and it make us furious and we organize uh, something what we called Women Congress. And this year there was the fifth of Women Congress. We thought that it will be the one event that will be probably smaller we didn't know who will come, if there will be interest among women, because there is many often during debate in our countries that there is no, let's say, room, no interest, no really uh, enough women interested in in the women issues, and with um, maybe not in the women issues, but with uh, doing something, not ready for for let's say take part and action that women are very overworked, then there is no way and no time and no money for them to take part in such uh, events. When we are going into the end, uh, one of the, because we had a very long list during the Congress of Women, very long list of, of, um, of our goals, uh, but we decided as a group, <laughs> 3,000 of women in 2009, that the pre is to have more women into uh, in the political uh, in the government in the, all these places where the the power is executed 
and decisions are taken. Then we, we decided that the main, main goal for 2009 will be introduce quota gender parity, in fact, uh, into Polish um, electoral system. Uh, and we decided ag- uh, as well that it will be not done via politicians, but via possibility of civic uh, draft. It meant that we have to uh, to collect more than 100,000 uh, signatures all over the country, and we can we could submit this act to the parliament. Uh, I think it, that it was very in, very good uh, uh, proposal. This proposal that we have to collect the signature because it's not the quota. I agree fully that quota itself is not enough, but even introducing quota, it, this is the the process of introducing. If it is done by the politician, there is something which again could be decided, let's say, somewhere. Uh, but it was done by society in the sense that we have to meet with people, we have to talk about it, we have to have uh, some uh, journalists on our sides, and many of them were sympathized with us, and it was really very nice to see how many actresses, uh, film directors, uh, journalists, professors support us. Uh, without that, it couldn't happen. Uh, and uh, I took part, and I always underline it. It was very good experience for me. I took part in the collection of the signature in shopping malls, and it was really fantastic because we, you discuss with people, ordinary people, who heard about it in TV and in radio, and some of them were saying, oh, no, it's something completely crazy how you can be for introducing quotas. Some were saying, oh, yes, yes, it's fantastic. Just give me the list I want to sign. Uh, and there was a constant, we tried to distribute some leaflets, some informations. Then it, this is uh, again the process of uh, raising consciousness uh, around the issue of the um, political representation. Uh, and when we took into consideration why the quota and why we need more women, this is not only the problem, we should remember that there are two sides of this representation. There is descriptive representation and substantial representation. And of course, descriptive, it means the numbers. And via quota, you can change the numbers. It doesn't mean necessarily that we are, will be able to change, for example, reproductive rights in Poland, because it needs much more than only to have that. But this is the first step, yes, I agree. And there is many reasons why we need more balanced representation. And for me, enough is justice. This is just unjust that there is less women in the parliament. Now women in Poland are better educated than men even. There is no uh, no any argument which can support the situation when the half of the better educated society is represented only by 24% or even less before uh, in the uh, in the parliament then for me this this uh, argument of justice is enough but we should remember that there is other uh, arguments. There is the problem of representation of the interest and the problem of representation of some experience and only uh, somebody who is from this group can bring this experience to the uh, parliament, for example. Then there is many, uh, many corners and many re- reasons why we should look very closely to the composition of the, our representatives in parliament. Uh, what is the then? Then the, our bill was submitted to the parliament. <coughs> we succeed in in collection the signatures, and in the mm, in the parliament it was changed into the quota of thirty five percent. And now we have this quota of thirty five percent into electoral lists. What is very of course there was uh, again the hard work. It was not enough to collect the, the signatures. We, as a Congress of Women, were going to all important figures, let's say, in the country, to the every leaders of the party, political party, to every leaders of the uh, parliamentary committees uh, in the parliament. Uh, uh, we visited even Archbishop of Warsaw, and we just promote the idea and uh, and explain why we need it. 
uh, and we were very careful going to all these committees in the parliament and looking what they change in the um, draft. Uh, there is many crucial points in all these processes always. One of the crucial was when they try to change because the restriction in Poland is that list cannot be registered if there is not 35%. There was attempt in the parliament to change it into the monetary fine paying they do not fulfill. And we said that this is completely not effective. We know it from France experience, just don't do it. The only effective way is just not to register the list, which is not fulfilling the requirement of the uh, quota. And uh, quota was introduced. And uh, in the, it's, uh, the, the very good uh, result is, of course, in the electoral list, because everybody has to fulfill this uh, principle. And parties try to show that they can do it without any problems. Uh, it was very, uh, for me, uh, as a scientist, it was very nice to observe how they completely changed their discourse. Because during the parliamentary debate, they were saying very often that there is not enough women, there is not this supply, um, supply part. Uh, and then who will be on have to put them our wives of, or our daughters or our colleagues or our friends, not politician, it means. Uh, but uh, uh, after uh, quota was introduced, suddenly all political parties, when we visited them again as a Congress of Women and asking if do you, do you have enough women, we can submit the list for you. Uh, and they said, no, 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 we have much more than we can include. And really, all these parties put almost 40%, and all of them show us that they not only fulfill 35, but they include more women. But the result is very different if we in take into consideration different parties. As a whole parliament, now we increased uh, the representation from 20% to almost 24%. But there is very big difference between the parties. The most successful, in a sense of, of in, uh, introducing more women in, into parliament, is um, civic platform, Platforma Obywatelska, the ruling party. But we should in, take into consideration that they have soft quota in the party. Uh, thanks to some members of the parliament, women members, who force uh, uh, party to introduce soft quota in 2007, before the election in 2007, they have the rule that they have to have at least one woman in the first three and at least two women in the first five uh, uh, persons on the lists. And they had 40 something uh, women in the, uh, in the lists. They have 34% of women in the first places and they introduce 34% uh, of women to, uh, from their lists. While there are some parties, even these left-wing parties, which include some program for women in their uh, program before the elections, who, for example, include only 10% of women into the first places, then they introduce around 12, 14 percent of women to the parliament, then it's very much depend how, how uh, parties are, uh, are uh, playing with all this uh, quota system. And we, together with the uh, Institute of Public Affairs, and I had a pleasure to, run, to, to, to govern this, this uh, project, we looked into some district, how it happened that women sometimes succeed better than it looks from the list and sometimes worst. And there is many mechanisms how they do it, how political party, if they are not woman friendly, play with the electoral system. Then what is the, the lesson, <laughs> lesson from that? Of course, this is not enough only to introduce quota, but this is very good first step, not only in terms of of increasing the number of women, but of keeping the woman issue on the agenda and reminding that this is very important to have this part of, legisla or of legislation 
uh, on the agenda. I think that without this, all these efforts, we never could, even if we uh, don't discuss it so deeply, impossible to introduce the longer maternity leave, for example, without this uh, pressure from many women organizations, Congress of Women, and talking about women issues in Poland. Everything which is, I think, done last year in this sphere is because they, politicians f feel, f can, uh, can li listen to, uh, to the voice of women and they feel the pressure from the woman uh, side. And again, some words about this, that quota is not enough. In the Congress of Women, we are working on many different other activities, training for women, uh, finding money for these trainings, for organizing uh, local congresses. Every month there are some congresses. Tomorrow I'm going to, to Lublin for the regional congress. This is not the only central event because this is completely not enough to have something in Warsaw. But the widespread of idea, this is very, very important things. And keeping the, the um, high on, on to agenda, the woman issue, there is, uh, I think, the crucial point. I think that our experience show us that political will is, of course, the crucial, but political will is not, in a sense, the free will in this sphere. They have to feel that there is a strong lobby uh, which press them to, to change something. Otherwise, they are very happy to sit in the parliament and to change nothing. And we have to press them as a woman, as a civil society, to remember that there are not only men in society, but majority of people in society that are women. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs> I will now open the floor to the discussion. Um, please introduce yourself and point out uh, to whom you would like to ask the question or make the comment. I would like to remind that this session will also um, refer to our keynote speech as well as to the four presentations made by our panelists. So uh, please uh, introduce yourself briefly. Um, and I would like to keep questions really briefly because we have half hour left. The gentleman there, please. Yeah. Proszę bardzo. Andrzej Kopczyński, pani profesor postulat, aby więcej dziewcząt było w naukach ścisłych. Ale to przecież nie zależy od władz uczelni, kogo przyjmą na dany kierunek, tylko od samych zainteresowanych. Uważam, że to należałoby zacząć w ogóle od małego, od wychowania, bo przecież przynajmniej w Polsce dziewczynki bawią się y, lalkami, y, chłopcy, y, klocki coś tam, y, jakieś takie majsterkują. Nawet jak kupujemy prezenty, to kupujemy prezenty ściśle określone dla dziewcząt, no to tą przysłowiową y, y, Barbie, a chłopcom już Lego kupujemy. I to tak wzrasta z... Boże podstawową czy gimnazjum, dziewczynki są nastawiane do tego, żeby się zająć y, rodziną, żeby zająć się tymi, takimi typowymi, nie powiem babskimi, bo to nieładne słowo, kobiecymi y, jak, jakimiś, że tak powiem, sprawami, a chłopcy mają inter... być tymi, tymi przywódcami. Dziękuję bardzo. Profesor Dublin, would you like to answer? Uh, very shortly, because we, of course, he is right, but it's only a very small element. See, uh, it, uh, we shouldn't make the mistake to burden all that was what is missing now to education in the early stages, because then we are really quickly back to women themselves and say they are, let's say, uh, uh, are doing the mistakes. It is one of the elements. And if everyone, father or mother, let's say, uh, takes to that what you are saying very rightly, that's a fine thing, but it's not everything. Thank you very much. What I propose is that I will take a few questions. Yes. We'll just collect the group of five questions. So again, introduce yourself and to whom you would like to ask the question. We'll start with the lady there, then the lady there, and then I see the hand there, and then we have four now. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then five ladies. Okay. 
Krystyna Krzekotowska, Stowarzyszenie Obywatelskich Inicjatyw. Ja mam w związku z tym, że jesteśmy prawie że w przededniu wyborów do Parlamentu Europejskiego, takie pytanie, czy w innych państwach, szanowne panie mogą potwierdzić, jest również takie wysokie wymagania jak w Polsce, gdy chodzi o liczbę niezbędnych do złożenia listy wyborczej podpisów. U nas to jest, no, można powiedzieć, bariera dla kobiet, zwłaszcza do, no, bardzo trudna do przekroczenia, mianowicie 10 tysięcy na każdą listę. Ponieważ brałam udział w wielu kampaniach, mogę powiedzieć nawet, że trafiłam jako swoisty ta rekordziska do księgi Guinnessa pod względem liczby ka przegranych kampanii wyborczych, bo większość po lost, pierwszej, drugiej przegranej uh, wycofuje się. Ja brałam udział w wszystkich kampaniach, parlament European Parliament, local government and so on, so I ran in all the elections and this led me to write a book on election law, but anyway, one of the obstacles is the uh, threshold, the number of signatures. I think that in Poland we have the highest threshold. What's it like in the other countries? I understand this is a question to all our panelists. Yes, and... Hello, Agnieszka Grzybek, uh, Hanzibel Foundation. I have, a, uh, I have two questions. One to uh, Ms. Veronika Szprincowa from Forum Pedesat Percent. You mentioned that there were no attempts of introducing quota in the Czech Republic, but uh, as far as I remember, there was an attempt made by the Ministry of, of Labor and Social Affairs two years ago. There was a proposal of this from my colleagues from gender studies. They told us that there was a proposal made by the ministry of introducing a 30% uh, quota to the list. So can you please explain this why this proposal failed? Uh, and my second question is to all the participants, because one of the questions which is settled in the title of this uh, conference is, uh, is a common strategy for Central and Eastern Europe post question is, do you think it's possible or not? And what would be the uh, and what would be the role of women's movement? Because you didn't mention in your presentation the role of women uh, of women's movement. So could it be a supporter of this idea? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Madame De, please. Uh, hello, my name is Joanna Lebedzinska. I come from Wrocław. Uh, my is uh, about uh, is the legal mechanism, we are talking about legal mechan me mechanisms of qu uh, quotas, is not enough, it just, uh, I mean, uh, is for example uh, that, uh, because Professor Małgorzata Fuszara already answered uh, this question, that this is not everything, legal mechanism is not everything, we have to work more uh, with society, with, uh, with uh, uh, kind of, uh, um, consensus about it yes we have to we have to start discussion among uh, everyone so is uh, is the answer uh, that uh, the civil society is a is a uh, is the answer for uh, for for that yes if the civil society is more uh, developed is uh, is is more will to have more women in 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 uh, in, uh, in parliament or, or just in uh, yes women in, in politics in general. And uh, my, uh, my second, uh, just a note, just, just to note something that uh, we are talking uh, about women in politics and women in science or technology, but also there is very few women in sports. Yes, we are in building of a stadium, of national stadium, and <laughs> football is a man play, uh, mostly. Uh, although uh, there is a lot of women playing football, because I'm very interested in that topic, is that as well that this, this gender index, the financing, for example, of sports, is the issue because sports. Yeah, we are. It's it's, it's really important. Sports. It can, sports is a part. So, is it is it some junctions between this 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 these all elements like justice, law, uh, sport, technology, uh, education? Yeah, because it's not only justice, it's not only legal mechanism. It's 
all our life, uh, which is, yeah, it's, it's like, uh, it has influence, yes. So it, my question was only about legal mechanism. Is, 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 is everything we can do? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm all in favor of opening Polish football to qualified women because men certainly cannot do their job. <laughs> so, and we'll move to the lady on the right. Alicja Moszyńska zajmuje się wspieraniem karier kobiet w biznesie, polityce, nauce. Mam, miałam teraz fantastyczne doświadczenie i przyjemność uczestniczyć w projekcie, który jest na Śląsku, e, wspieranie kobiet w polityce. Byłam dwa dni na obozie politycznym, gdzie e, próbowałam kobiety nauczyć e, networkingu i budowania własnej, e, wła, własnej pozycji w biznesie, własnego wizerunku. E, jest to projekt, który będzie obejmował również Następne, następne warsztaty, do których się trenerzy przygotowują. I chciałam się zapytać, czy w krajach, które tutaj są reprezentowane, były takie Of the countries represented here, did you have um, similar experiences and uh, any ideas, any good advice on how to run such a workshop, such a networking workshops? In business, we have uh, training courses. I run uh, courses like this, but this was the uh, first time I did a networking workshop for politics. I also ran for European Parliament in my time. I have experience in business and I'm also uh, happy that you've mentioned uh, the term business in the context of uh, politics, uh, speaking of effectiveness in business and the uh, effectiveness of women in politics. So in the countries represented here, ha is there any body of knowledge, any know-how that I might find useful in the workshops and practical activities that I will be running in uh, two weeks' time. The idea is for uh, this kind of uh, workshop to be done nationwide, not just inside the front will go to the lady at the front uh, with the white and black scarf. Okay, in this case, proszę bardzo, pani w szarej Magda uh, Pochyć from the Batory Foundation. I have a question to Professor Fushara. We've managed to ascertain that legal mechanisms are insufficient, but they are still important. Uh, so is the uh, Women's uh, Congress uh, considering uh, strengthening these legal mechanisms which were curtailed in the uh, legislative process? So do we have any plans uh, to develop or this legislative uh, legal process. Panelists and keynote speaker to briefly um, answer those questions. And maybe we will start with, um, um, who would like to go first? <laughs> Please, go ahead. On purpose, I uh, no, took this opportunity because I restricted myself in the first intervention. Uh, I was curious so, um, about your interventions, your questions, so that's why I was so fast. When it comes to the uh, Slovak representation in the European Parliament, we have a party list, so the, um, I cannot give any kind of substantial advice, but uh, the experience or, or the attitude of Slovak parties uh, is very significant. Uh, Slovak parties, they love to send their uh, female politicians to the European Parliament because it's a very nice way how to get rid of them uh, from the party politics. So this is something amazing. According to the proportion, there are 30%. This is the only institution where Slovakia uh, is overrepresented. We have 30% of MMPs are women. And clearly, in several parties, it was done on purpose by, uh, let's say, a male conspiracy, if you want. Uh, so it's very strange behavior. But it says something about the situation in Slovakia. Uh, to the question about the common, uh, common strategy, I uh, uh, assume that it's very important to meet, to share, and to exchange experience. But uh, 
uh, in my opinion, because I am supporter of this, let's say, uh, gradual, um, incremental um, ways of improving uh, political participation, uh, the sharing is only is the only way how we can promote it. But it. Uh, if this should be done on the mobilization, on uh, the broad social movement, on education, we need to find uh, some specific uh, patterns uh, which would be appealing to the certain society. Because despite of all similarities, we are still different. Even we are different uh, from Czechs. Uh, after having uh, almost 70 years of common state, uh, we are more similar. Uh, I mean, we Slovaks are more more similar to Hungarians because we had not very happy, but yet 1,000 year of marriage uh, with Hungarians. So uh, sharing is important, but you have to invent it uh, for pro domo to organize something what is uh, what will appeal the domestic so society. Um, the, the question about the, uh, if the civil society is the answer, I would say yes. But uh, in Slovakia, I would add business is better answer. Because in business sphere, we have many experienced women, very successful women, but they do not want to identify with a women's movement. This is, again, this uh, very typical sociological barrier. And I uh, actually do not know how to overcome uh, it. I met only uh, maybe two or three uh, top uh, uh, women uh, from the banking sector who are willing, uh, for example, to engage in uh, some activities promoting uh, women's self-esteem and self-confidence. Uh, the, the most uh, favorite example for my students is uh, that uh, one of them, uh, she told uh, the story uh, saying, with, uh, starting with the proposition that a woman is uh, the best manager. She has this complex, so, so, uh, complex problem solving capacity. And she immediately went to the uh, example how to manage the family with three kids. And then she uh, jumps straight uh, to the conclusion after this experience, if you are able to manage uh, the family, then you can manage any kind of business. But uh, in Slovakia, we are lacking uh, this type of women. But of course, later on, I am willing to uh, g uh, give you some advice. And I will stop on this because I was politely told that I should stop. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please do blame me. Um, we have many questions in the floor and I want to give everyone an opportunity to ask a question. So, um, who would like to be a second speaker? Please, Very Professor. Easy. Yes, please. Lengthily. You see, uh, cooperating means finding good examples from every country and making them known. So, I think uh, we should not only, let's say, focus on that what is missing, but uh, let's say, look for good examples and tell each other and say, they do it this way, we want to have that in the same situation. Uh, well, uh, the requirements for parties taking part in elections or individuals are different in Germany, but not more than 500. Thank you very much. Uh, Reka, would you like to address some of those questions, please? I um, don't want to repeat the same thing, but certainly civil society is the answer and the common strategy, strategy might lie in sharing good examples and then you could find best practices all around the country. That, that's certainly important, but we should also remember to take advantage of what we have. Uh, I think it's very hard to enter the political scene because of the thresholds in the EP, in national elections, in local elections. But we have women there because Hungarian politics, we also send women to the EP to get rid of them. But there we have a huge expertise of women doing political work. So why not take advantage of them having uh, and having worked together as well on the regional level. So that's, that's one thing that I, I wanted to mention and draw attention to. And the other thing I want to come back to you on sports. 
I think it's crucial. Mm -hmm. In Hungarian politics, football is a political asset playing football, owning a club, going to matches. And I think it's very important to look at women in a complex picture and to see if they are missing on sports, if they are missing out on business opportunities. It's connected to how they are missing out on on, um, on the political side. Although it's very hard to discover those networks. And I'm from the academic uh, field, so maybe add, uh, this is my last suggestion, is that it's important to develop some methodology to discover networks. So to apply network analysis and, and all the new tools that we have to this field and to see how things work out and what are the hidden barriers. Because I'm, 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 I truly think that, uh, and then that will be the next panel, it's not just numbers and MPs in the parliament, but, but women everywhere. And we don't, don't know about those barriers, we know about the psychological part, but not, not about, for example, about the sports <coughs> part. And it's so, so well connected to politics that there is a lot of work to do there. And we need tools for that, and I think we are missing those tools as well. Thank you very much. Um, Veronica, would you like to address some of those questions? Yeah, I, I should uh, answer the Agnieszka's question about this proposal. I, I uh, was talking about that, but maybe I wasn't clear enough. Uh, so to give a better context uh, to this proposal, it was uh, worked out by the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and it was a completely prepared uh, bill, uh, ready for, for submission to the government. And uh, uh, it was finished when, uh, in the time of the election, and there was still the Government Council for Equal Opportunities for uh, Men and Women. It was chaired by uh, Commissioner for Human Rights. And it was, uh, back then, it was located at the Office of the Government. And uh, he was ready to submit uh, this, or to propose this bill to the newly established government. But, uh, there was a big discussion within the council as an advisory body of the government whether to actually submit it or not. And it was a consensus not to submit it uh, and not to endanger the existence of this advisory body as such, because uh, bringing out this topic would be really risky. So it was very pragmatic decision not to submit um, this proposal. Um, just because uh, to not to damage the image uh, of this of this advisory body, and as for the the other very interesting question, I think that it all lead us back uh, to a very important thing, which was already said, that uh, the gender discrimination is a structural discrimination in a society, and it goes across uh, various areas and I think that we should this in our minds and to be able to locate it in in many <clears throat> many areas so I think that it's all from me thank you very much and professor Fushara please uh, the one question addressed uh, directly to me, it was about this uh, changing in the electoral law. And of course, we try to do what we promised the people who signed the proposal, because we collect uh, the signature for 50-50, not 35 percent. And we all the time try to press, but no, this time, we try to change this via a woman parliamentary group in the parliament. There is a proposal to change it into 50-50 and the zip, zip order. But as far as I know, there is not, they are not certain if they can have majority because there is even discussion in the party, then this is a very slow process. But we try to ask every time, every year when the Prime Minister is present in the, and he is every year present five minutes during the Congress of Women, we ask them about this, we ask uh, politicians, we ask uh, uh, Marshal of the Parliament, Panią Kopacz, every time when we have opportunity, 
but now it's of course the way which is not so uh, easy and I understand that it could be difficult. And only one uh, more uh, remark about this training. The trainings are everywhere, let's say, in Poland, not only in Silesia. Last uh, month there was, I think, a series of three trainings organized by Congress of Women and many others. And uh, it, to, according to my experience, I remember trainings, I think, organized around 10 years ago for women, Uh, the 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 biggest the the, the very good uh, way how we organize it was organized by the professors from uh, gender studies from university women NGOs and some activists from business and from uh, from um, politics because this combination give us the, the give women let's say much more information and space for discussions about many things. Thank you. I want to assure you we are not going to lose our coffee break. Uh, we've been allowed to continue for another five, ten minutes. So we have a room for three more questions. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Lucia Zachariasova. I'm from the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs of the Czech Republic. Uh, I would like to ask Reka and Veronika, you spoke about Uh, quite high support to quotas in the Czech Republic and in Hungary. Maybe uh, I'm not sure if uh, Slovakia and Poland has some similar statistics about this, but there is still no political. So, how you explain this? That there is on one hand quite a big support of public, and on the other hand, there is no political to open this question at least debate about it. Uh, and it's for Reka and Veronika, but maybe if you want also mention something in your Slovak and Polish experience, I would be happy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, this is the last chance. Any more questions for the panelists? Good, then. Yeah, there's a question there. Please. Iwona Piątek, Partia Kobiet. Ja chciałam się, to znaczy chciałabym coś dodać do wypowiedzi pani profesor Fuszara said, and I hope she will agree with me, because it hasn't been said here, mentioned here, the, no mention was made about two entities that do influence the awareness of women. These are two political parties. The Women's Party, that's my party, which was formed from the uh, big movement of women in 2006. It was called, the movement was called Poland is a Woman, and then at uh, the beginning of 2007 a party was registered, and there in the party's program um, the quotas was one of the most important issues. And I think I think the, 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 the party showed women that it is possible to do things. The other party is the Green Party that gives a practical example of the quotas uh, because this idea, this principle is applied at every level there. They have co-managers um, uh, there and they took up the idea of quotas much, much earlier. First, the Women's Congress is a great social movement, gathering women from practically all political parties, also non-governmental organizations. And I believe that this Congress is a great lobbying tool, and it's a great success that gathers all women in Poland. The final word to all our panelists. Um, and maybe I will start this time with Professor Fushara, uh, if you would like to have a final word. Uh, problem with all these questions, uh, if the hmm, society supports some solutions or not, is really uh, problematic in this sense that it's very much depend how you ask. And since many years we ask the questions about the, the uh, presence of women in uh, political parties, in parliament, in government, etc. And to be very short, waste majority are saying, especially uh, women, majority of women are saying we need more women. It doesn't matter if you ask about business parties or, pol or parliament or government, we need more women. Uh, and the, in Poland, uh, the, the 
problem is that this kind of uh, this attitude is much more popular among women than among men. This is usually difference um, in the public opinion survey around twenty yeah. percent between men and women, men and women. It's different if you ask about quota itself, but again, it's <laughs> this is the a crucial point how you formulate the question. If you use the word quota, there are many people are against. If you use about the result, do we should introduce the measures to increase women, uh, more women into uh, parliament, to, to introduce more women into parliament, the, the answers are much more positive than in a sense uh, both sides, somebody who is against and somebody who is for quota, have some <laughs> sir, argument, some arguments. They can take some arguments from the public opinion survey. Uh, but uh, there, and in Poland as well, when we had this attempt to introduce quota, there was a group of women who were against, and they organized themselves. Uh, then there is not, of course. Anywhere, it's like this that everybody, every woman support quota uh, or uh, all society. Then this is usually the problem with, uh, as I mentioned, the problem how you ask the question uh, and how you uh, uh, how you formulate the problem uh, and what is the crucial in this this um, survey. The, uh, I agree fully, of course, with uh, representative of uh, of Women Party, uh, and I think that the, uh, this party shows that there is a big, um, a big possibility. There is a popular, let's say, uh, effort in the society to support the women organizations and organizations which are organized around the women issues because the actually the women party was the first who gathered women not only from women organizations but as well uh, some women who never before were associated to wom women problems and it was i think the crucial evidence that there is a room for support from many corners in society this is why i think that there was possible the success of uh, a Congress of Women, which actually is operating in the way how the new women movements are operating. And this is, I think, again, the, the crucial point that we try to, to gather everybody, every woman who are supportive for the women issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. I would like now to give the floor to Professor Dabler Melin for her closing remarks. Yes, very shortly. To recommend something to you, I would say, say don't consider the question whether public opinion is pro or contra quota too much. And I, I would like to tell you why I recommend that. I think, and my experience is, that it's not only linked to how you formulate the question, but to a qu a quite a lot of psychological affairs. You see, when we introduced the quota, my generation of women politicians were in parliament. We had made it nevertheless. There were lots and lots and lots and lots of journalists that said, oh, these are the losers. Uh, they need the quota because they are losers. And you see, this violated, this hurt quite a lot of, of women politicians deeply. And uh, that is why they said that, because it's a power thing. It's simply and brutally a power thing. So don't consider it. And you will find uh, in older female politicians very few, but you will find them that feel uh, if there are more women in politics, even their power is endangered. So it's not a miracle that some of them are not so much uh, in favor of that. And if you have young women, uh, as we have heard, and this is my experience too, they acknowledge the standards that they have to fulfill higher standards that, uh, that men. If you look into the parliaments, there are lots of dumb men. And of course, uh, I, I don't think that women are more intelligent, but they are not less intelligent, but the standards are different. So my recommendation would be, don't consider it too much. Decide which way you want to go, the legal, the fixed, uh, the soft quota, and then simply do it. 
and try it out. And if you have to change it, then do it. Change them again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor uh, Malova, you, has, you have as much time as you want to make final <laughs> remarks, <laughs> but I hope you'll be brief. Okay, I will, I will try to uh, be again uh, short. Uh, talking about uh, political will in Slovakia, there is no political will, but there is a formal demand. Politicians, male politicians, they do not dare to say, uh, we no, do not want women in the parliament or in the party. But of course, they want to have a certain type of women. And actually, we had recently, just a few days ago, a scandal. Uh, four uh, MP, um, MPs from the Social Democratic uh, women, they just copy the, uh, the way how men behave. Uh, they uh, abuse the plane, the government planes, and they went basically on a private trip to St. Petersburg. So this is this is the type uh, of women they uh, they want to uh, be in parliament represented. So if there is any recommendation, me as an academic uh, can have is that women in our countries uh, should learn that politics is about decision making. And it's not a, a power game. And this is, it is, a power game. It is but it, you cannot increase interest in of women. And I will uh, argue with you, uh, you but cannot increase women participation in uh, politics if you will not convince them, OK, it's a power game, game uh, but this, in these countries, they reject to go to the politics because they perceive it only as a power game and not a, uh, as a decision-making process. And of course, the women here in this region are very qualified. And uh, just because in families, they do majority of decision uh, in families about spendings are done in an excellent way by women. So then I, I still do not understand why they do not want to make decision in politics. The end of story. Much. Okay, I have to be. I try to be really, really short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as for as for Lutia's question, I think that uh, the, the the answer is uh, very simple in a way, because uh, poli in politics there is a limited number of seats for sure, and uh, now it's male dominated. In the Czech Republic, you have eighty percent of men there, and well. 30% of them would lose their seats. And I think, therefore, there can be, in a way, a political will. Thank you. Oh, yes, and uh, uh, about, again, pub public opinion, it's, I think it's very important not to uh, think that public opinion is voters' will. So voting is different pu from public opinion. If you ask somebody a question, they will answer something, let's put it that way. But when they go voting, they have very different issues to look at. And if it's gender not an issue, it's no matter what they say at public opinion polls, mm -hmm. except if it's, not, uh, it's, if it's not very extreme. And very briefly, my last word, I think uh, it's also important to remember the resources that all the women have and try to, try to rely on those. So we are talking about all the things that women shouldn't do, shouldn't copy the man, but I think they should build up their own, um, their own way of networking, which, is, which can be very different from the man way of networking. So, you know, don't go to wine clubs, but bring your kids and go to a playground if you are talking about local politicians or anything that the, the resources that you have you should use to build up capacities and after that change the game of power because I truly think politics is, is the game of power and you need power to enter that. But you should Thank you. I will make very brief remarks to sum up this panel. First of all, I want to assure you that my voice, I'm not the man who is closing the conference. There is actually a very good <laughs> panel afterwards, and I strongly support, invite you to, to participate in it. Um, I think we've been discussing a number of issues, and if I can only focus on, on three of them. First of all, I think we all agree that we need a comprehensive approach. The legal quotas need to be supported, uh, reinforced by voluntary measures, also voluntary measures which political parties are introducing internally. They need to be supported by awareness building, training, um, working with uh, women leaders. 
When it comes to trainings, our office really supports many of them um, throughout the region. But I also want to tell you personally that we believe that we already have a lot of qualified women. Trainings should not be a strategy to buy time to tell women you are not qualified, you need to continue learning. You know, when it comes to qualifications in politics, somehow we never ask men about their qualifications. We keep talking about qualifications when it comes to women. So trainings are extremely important strategy, but they need to be uh, as an additional element to other strategies. And legal mechanisms are not a sufficient but necessary condition to achieve rapid progress when it comes to gaining full and equal representation. I don't know, I mean, I'm sure no one in this room wants to wait 50 years. And we do not have any other mechanisms, like legal mechanisms, to make sure that we're not waiting 50 years. And it's not only just a public opinion who supports legal mechanisms in many countries. I want to also remind you, we have a very strong international framework. It's not only CEDO Convention Article 4, and it's not only Council of Europe Recommendation 2003-3, it's also OSC Ministerial Council decision from Athens 2009, which encourages all the participating states to introduce those legal measures. So we have a vox populi, citizens want that, and we have international obligations and commitments to make these things happen. So I want to thank our panelists. Thank you very much indeed for this lively discussion, and I would like to invite you to a coffee break. Thank you very much.